I'll focus on a particular theme which we will build on in the in tomorrow session also. Basically, yesterday I discussed about how Lord Ram demonstrates how to respond to adversity, how he, even when he was unfairly treated, he responded with grace. We discussed about the acronym ACT hmm, as a way to graduate through the universe, which is a university of adversity. That distress comes upon everyone in this world. So today, we'll try to make sense of mm, trying to analyze the cause and the cure for adversity. Yesterday, I focused on the theme that how Lord Ram forgave Sita. Sorry, forgive Kai Kai, didn't decide to hold anything against her. But he did not have the same approach toward Ravan. So when we face difficulties in life, especially difficulties that come because of somebody's unfair dealings with us. So how do we respond at that time? On what basis do we respond? So generally, Say if we have a disease, if we can, we can compare adversity to a disease, then whenever there's a disease, we want to know, hey, what caused it? And what is the cure for it? So we could we will adopt a similar approach over here to try to understand, okay, when we are facing suffering, what is the cause of the suffering? So today's discussion, will primarily be focused on understanding the cause. And tomorrow, we will analyze the cure. This is not so black and white. There will be some aspects of the cure being discussed today also. Mm. Now, yesterday itself, I analyzed that there are times when we ascribe certain problems to our own destiny. So while at one level, Ram being exiled, he saw that it was unfair in the sense that he had done nothing to deserve being exiled, yet he saw it as the will of destiny and he accepted it. But then Sita abducted, that was all unfair, but he considered this time and accepted it. Hmm. That was unfair and Lord Ram corrected it. So, so why, when should we see something as destined and simply accept it? And when do we try to correct it? So broadly, there is a, some level of misunderstanding about the Vedic path that or the, that everything is seen as destiny and that leads to some level of passivity. Oh, you know, bad things happen. And whatever bad things happen, people accept because they think it is destined. It's just a matter of destiny. But that is not at all, broadly speaking, the teaching of the Vedic tradition. Why not? Because First, let's try to clarify terms. But there is karma, there is destiny, and then there is dharma, which we can call as duty or responsibility. This will be daiva. Now, there are multiple terms involved, and we'll see how these fit in. But the first point is when we are trying to understand cause. Of something, let me start with. Mm, I'll talk about three things with respect to the concept. Mm, then I'll talk about the context. And then contemplation. Mm, the three broad things I'll talk about. We are trying to understand 
what is the cause of suffering? Mm -hmm. So, for example, whenever suffering comes upon us, are we to see all suffering as our own karma? If that is the case, then should we never stand up to wrongdoers? Then why did Krishna tell Arjuna that he had to fight the war? Hmm? He could have said that, actually, you know, the suffering that you are going through is your own karma and just tolerate it. So, the concept is that, you know, every event, we place it in an explanatory framework. So basically, explanatory framework, this can, in Sanskrit can be called as a darshan. A darshan literally, darshan has many different meanings. Darshan means we can say the audience of the Lord. We behold the deity in the temple. That is darshan. Darshan offers refers to the word philosophy. The philosophy is basically shut darshan as that in the Vedic tradition. But darshan basically means a vision that we see. So how do we see things? So let's start with a simple example of how an event can be seen in different ways. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now, if Say my audio or video is unclear to you. Now, this is the event. Now, this could be placed in various contexts. One context could be that, that the audio is unclear. Let me put it in the box over here. This is the event. I'm trying to find the cause of the event. So one cause could be that my mic is poor. Mm -hmm. Then another cause could be that, that your, your speaker is poor. Mm -hmm. Another cause could be that my net is poor. Mm -hmm. Another cause could be your net is poor. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Your net is poor. Now, other cause could be that maybe we could just go on. Say your okay, let's put it. Say your hearing is going down. Mm -hmm. Other cause could be my speaking, my voice is becoming poor. Is So maybe I've got some throat infection. We could go on and for one same event, we could come up with various different causes. Mm -hmm. Now, which of these is right? Well, there is no easy way. There is no instant way to know. So the normal way is that when we are looking for a cause, the principle that is talked in the Mimamsa is start with the Drushta and then move towards the Adrushta. Start with, it, start with an explanation that is visible and then move towards an explanation that is invisible. So for example, if I have a stomach upset or say if I have a cough, the, the, the visible explanation could be, visible means what is immediately perceivable, not necessarily with the eyes, but perceivable. So if I have cough, if I have cough, I could say, you know, was I exposed to cold water? Did I go out in the rains? Did I drink too much like a cough? Did I take any cold drinks? Now, if I can't find that, then I could go more towards, do I have a sickly disposition? Is it that I'm more vulnerable to this? If 10 people drank the same drink, but nobody else got cold, then I got cold. Then it's not so much the drink, it is my own disposition. Or beyond that, I could say when nothing is, 
I don't seem to have settled disposition, but still I have got this. So maybe there is some infection going around. And the infection also, the infection, why I'm putting it a little bit, it's not visible to us easily. Now you could say that cold water means there's an infection anyway. But that is, let's put it some, it's some unknown infection is there. Like most of us had not heard about coronavirus before the pandemic came. Hmm. Now, like that, you could go and eventually I might say this must be, my, my, must be some past karma. So, if somebody, say, eats a dozen ice creams on a cold night, and then the next morning they have a terrible throat. Now, is it due to their karma? Well, yes, but it is not their past life karma. It is their past night karma. <laughs> so basically, the point is that any event that happens, we can put it in many different con many different frames. So darshan means darshan means basically the vision of what is the cause of the problem. So when we talk about philosophy, philosophy is an elaborate worldview. See, even in the word worldview. There is the idea view is there. How it helps us understand the world. So world view, view is there in it. So basically, now I'm coming to this point of karma. That karma, the karma philosophy, this particular darshan, it is meant to expand our existing vision. It is not meant to, sorry, it is meant to expand our existing vision. It is not meant to re replace or reject our existing vision. That means if I can find out from an immediate perspective what caused this, Say, if a husband and wife are not able to get along together. And the husband says that, oh, my always complaining. Or the wife says that, oh, my husband doesn't understand me only. Now, both of them can go and say, oh, maybe it's my bad karma that I have a spouse like this. Well, that could be an explanation. But first, look at it. Now, have I done something? Because of which my partner is the my partner is uh, is unhappy with me. So if say if I if I promise to do something, if I do it, and then actually the other person may be more pleased with me. And if I have promised to do something and not done that, and the other person is displeased with me, and then I say, oh, this person is always angry with me. That's because of my uh, because of my bad. No, or is it that, no, have I asked that, you know, I would like you to understand me. You, I would want you to talk with me, spend some time with me. If I have not asked that, if I just assume anything, that person not doing it. So basically, then there's no point to bring in the bigger frame. So for example, let's consider some practical situations, or uh, even in the scriptures, if you consider in the Ramayana. So when Lord Ram is in the forest, and at that time, on many occasions, when a particular thing happens, it is not when something unexpected happens. When, say, for example, there is a demon who suddenly comes and catches Sita. As Kabanda Bahu Chedana Rama. So, as Kabanda comes and he suddenly catches Sita and he takes her away. Does Lord Ram think, okay, you know, it's karma that Sita has been abducted, that this demon is so powerful? Okay, how does the demon come? We didn't see it. But then, let us, we have a sword. They cut off the arm. The demon and Sita is released from there. So, when Hanuman is not able to see Sita 
find Sita in the forest. Sorry, in Lanka. Does he think, oh, it's my own karma, I'm not able to find Sita? Okay, that could be one case. He says, maybe I've just not searched enough. And then, when he notices that, okay, I searched in all the palaces, but there's a garden over there. I haven't seen that garden. Let me look at the garden. So the point is, karma philosophy should not be used to neglect practical causes as well as practical solutions. It is only when practical causes and practical solutions do not make sense that just can't find out why this is happening. Then we look for a bigger explanation. And one of the bigger explanations is karma. So the idea is any event that we see, we can see it in multiple darshanas. So for example, uh, right now, darshanas means through different visions. We can see the same incident in different visions. When Lord Ram is going through the forest, at that time, so what happens? When Ram is in Kishkinda, when he's in Kishkinda, Sugriyu sees him as a threat. Why threat? Hey, is this a person sent by uh, Wali to assassinate me? Jambavan sees him as just some sages. He sees them as harmless. Hanuman sees him as curious. It triggers curiosity in our Hanuman. Oh, who are these people? I seem to, I, sometimes we have never met a person, but we feel as if there is some mystic sense of familiarity with that person. So, Hanuman doesn't consciously recognize Ram. It is something familiar about the people. He wants to know. And that's why he also takes the initiative and he says, I'll go and find out. So, when different people see Ram, no, they see him differently. So there is a famous verse in the Bhagavatam also when Krishna enters in the Mathura. He's seen differently in the Mathura Vesli Garina. He's seen differently by different people. So, so this is an example of how the same situation, the same event, the same person in this case, coming to a particular place can be seen very differently by different people. So in many ways, intelligence, there are many ways of defining intelligence. But Prabhupada gives a very interesting definition of intelligence in the ten, in chapter 10 purports. Now, each buddhir jnanam asam moha, that series of verses, uh, he talks about intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective. To see things in proper perspective. Now what does it mean? Proper perspective? That means there are many different perspectives in which a thing can be seen. Mm -hmm. The same event, this is a thing. When we use the word perspective, say if you are buying a house, then we might want a we might want a front view of the house. We want might a rear view of the house. We might want a top view of the house. So each of these are like perspectives. So we might want an inside view of the house. So the idea is what? Through different perspectives, we can get a better understanding. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, we humans have the capacity to look at things from different perspectives. But when Prabhupada uses the word proper perspective, what does it mean? Proper, how do we decide what is the proper perspective? So, if we are trying to buy a house, which is the proper perspective, we may say, okay, I want to see from all perspectives possible. But if you are going to buy a house, no house 
is going to be perfect from all perspectives. Now, some house may be perfect, some house may be perfect for the budget, but it may not be perfect in terms of locality. Some house may be perfect in terms of locality, but maybe it's not perfect in terms of ventilation. Some house may be perfect. In, so, like that, when we look at something from different perspectives, then proper perspective, what does it mean? How do we decide what is the proper perspective? It is primarily, it's a proper hierarchy of perspectives. Which is the most important perspective? Which is the most important perspective? Which is the least important perspective? Hmm? Or you could put it, which is the constructive perspective? Or a helpful perspective? And which is a unhelpful or even harmful perspective. Now, what do I mean by unhelpful or harmful perspective? Say, consider, suppose a doctor uh, is in emergency care and there's a patient who's being treated, and that patient has has drunk alcohol too much. And that person is not only thrown up, but the person has fainted. And maybe they already have liver issues. And because of that, that person's condition has become critical. Now, how should the doctor see that? The doctor can see the patient as sick. The, the the doctor can see the per person as having have a sick body. You can see the person as also having a weak character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is this person drinking so much? Or the doctor can see that person just as a bum, as a loser, as a burden to humanity. Now, if a doctor is to their job, the doctor should not be prioritizing, oh, this person is such a loser. This person is such a is simply a burden on the humanity, drinking and wasting their life. The doc for the doctor, the pro now doctor may see like that. Oh, you know, so many young people are just wasting their lives in drinking and hurting themselves, and then uh, hurting uh, and wasting so much potential, wasting so much money, money of society. But the hierarchy, the first perspective should be: I am a doctor. This is a patient. Right now, I have to treat the patient. Afterwards, there may be other things to be done. So, it's uh, it's important to have the right perspective. And proper perspective means that we should know which perspective helps us to do our dharma. That's why I talk about karma, daiva, and dharma. The doctor's dharma is to do one's duty, so proper perspective. So perspective means this, what, which is the proper perspective? Which inspires us to do our dharma. If a perspective is discouraging us from doing our dharma, then that is an unhealthy perspective. It may not be a wrong perspective, but it is an unhelpful perspective. So, for example, if some guest has come to our home and they are staying in a particular room and the guest tells us, you know, actually I'm feeling very cold over here. And if we say, you know, this world is Dukkale. This world is a place of distress. Well, that may be true. But when somebody has come as a guest to our house, our purpose should be, how can I serve the guest properly? A guest is to be respected, is to be venerated. So that is not the time to speak philosophy. Although there is a valid perspective that this world is a place of distress. But our focus should be, if a guest is feeling cold, the perspective should not be at that time Teach philosophy. The perspective should be offer service. Okay. 
you know i can give i can i have extra heater in the room or i can give you some warm clothes what would you prefer mm -hmm. so basically now philosophy also has to be taught it's a two thing but that may not be the right time for that so proper perspective means that we have to think what inspire what inspires me to do my dharma so say you know if we are taking care of uh, you know if we are inspired by some senior devotee and that devotee is living very purely and we are very inspired by how how devoted they are how pure hearted they are and then suddenly we come to know that they get some, they got some terrible disease like cancer then at that time how should we see it if if a uh, advanced devotee gets cancer mm -hmm. now using philosophy itself we could go towards one perspective that is oh i thought this devotee is so pure but uh, this they got this terrible cancer and everything happens because of one's karma so what karma must this person have done no this person i thought was pure this person is not pure actually so this must have done bad karma hmm? this person is a bad karma doer and this is not a healthy perspective we should see this is an opportunity for seva whatever is the cause of this particular disease what is disease that is immaterial for me for me this is a senior devotee the devotee has guided me inspired me so whatever be the cause this has happened i should see that this is krishna's arrangement by which i can do some seva so some of you may know that i need crutches for walking so i had polio since i was one so once i was giving a talk in a very leftist university in india and after that one one young boy one young man he asked a question he says you know according to your philosophy everything bad that bad happens is because of one's own karma so you have polio that means you must have done some bad karma and if you have done bad karma then what right do you have to tell us to not do bad karma to teach what right do you have to teach us yes and undoubtedly i must have done some bad karma because of which i have got this polio but the lord is so merciful that he has accepted even me in his service despite my bad karma no you have not done any bad karma like me the lord will accept you even more easily so the point is that we need to focus on what is helpful over there what is helpful in drawing us toward the lord in drawing others toward the lord so this in proper intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective sometimes we can use philosophy and justify seeing things from an unhealthy unhelpful or even harmful perspective now how can a, can a philosophical perspective be harmful well yes if that philosophical perspective makes us heartless it makes us Uh, unhelpful in our actions then that is not good for example say if in our neighborhood a flood has occurred and we are safe because maybe we have a we have we have wealth or we have a secure home but others are in trouble so at that time if we think oh everybody suffering their own karma let them suffer no we should see that Okay, if I have some facilities, if I have some safety, everybody else is distressed. They are all parts of God, and this is an opportunity for me to do some service. So the same situation can be seen from different perspectives, and it requires intelligence to understand which is the proper perspective. So broadly speaking, which is the proper perspective? It is that which inspires us to do our dharma. to move to move ultimately our dharma is not just our family responsibility or national responsibility is that ultimately it is to serve krishna it inspires us to serve krishna it inspires us to bring others closer to krishna when that is the focus then that is what and so krishna 
talks in that same chapter about buddhi he talks about buddhi buddhir jnanam asammoha he talks about i believe in 10.3 and 4 but then in that same chapter he talks later about buddhi yoga that's in 10.10 tatami buddhi yogam tam ye namam upayantite so for us we don't just want buddhi buddhi yoga means buddhi yoga is a compound word it can be understood in different ways but one way to understand it is buddhi to do yoga that in this sir yoga means connection so in this situation how can i make a helpful connection with krishna how can i make a helpful connection with this person so that i can come closer to krishna so teshyam tad yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam tadami buddhi yogam tam yenama payanti te krishna says the buddhi to do yoga so yoga for us means the connection with the lord but yoga can broadly mean connection or harmony so how can i maintain harmony in the situation so if say we may be worshiping krishna but if we go to a temple of the devatas or if we are invited to a temple of the devatas uh, where maybe there is some festival and they are inviting us to do kirtans now at that time if we in the temple of the devata start talking about how worshiping the devata the less and people is less intelligent and you should all be worshiping krishna then that that will not be buddhi that will lead to yoga that is buddhi which will lead to viyoga viyoga means separation not union people will become alienated from us people start thinking you know if you are coming to this devata's temple instead of glorifying the devata you are minimizing the devata over there that is not not appropriate so there is a time when we can talk about a philosophy but if you are invited to devata temple just to kirtan maybe speak something general about vedic wisdom talk about atma gyan talk about the importance of sanatan dharma the universality we can talk about that which will inspire people to come closer to the lord to come closer to the lord in various ways whatever it might be so in the leaf i am invited to ganesh utsav to speak i speak about how ganesh what are the ways in which we can serve ganesh what are the ways in which we can glorify ganesh so one of them is actually ganesh became the he wrote the mahabharat he took his own tooth and and he used that as a pen to write the mahabharat and in the mahabharat is the bhagavad gita so ganesh put so much efforts to write the bhagavad gita for us so by reading the bhagavad gita we will actually be serving lord ganesh any author when you write they write a book or even a transcriber they transcribe a book then they want that book to be read and they'll be grateful if you read the book so instead of criticizing the worship of ganesh we see how they can connect so this is the buddhi yoga so basically for every one of us going back to the starting point they mentioned why did lord ram accept as karma when kai as destiny when uh, when kai kai send him away and why did not accept as destiny when sita was abducted that is because the focus is not on destiny there's destiny we can see destiny as one offering us one more darshan that uh, past karma and destiny this is what offers us one more way of looking at things but that is not the only way of looking at things so we need to say okay what is the practical way of looking at things right now is that the only constructive way yes maybe yes maybe not it depends so it is not the only darshan so sometimes things go wrong despite our best efforts and then instead of simply thinking oh life is all chaotic nothing ever works right we see yeah there is something called destiny and sometimes things work according to destiny so let me understand that let me accept that and then we move ahead in my life so when we have this attitude what happens is we can always be constructive in the way we work i can give one more example and shila prabhupad was told about the rath yatra in london 
The first Satyatra was done in San Francisco. The second was done in London. The second Satyatra was done in London. At that time, the devotees, they decided to make a bigger cart, a huge cart. Uh, but they did not expand the wheels proportionately. And then the Rath went for some distance and the Rath hole collapsed. It was a disaster. It was a PR nightmare. It was a debacle. And the devotees were de dejected. And they wrote to Prabhupada saying, Prabhupada, was Krishna unhappy with us? Did the Rath collapse because of our poor devotion? And Prabhupada replied, no, the Rath co collapsed because of your poor engineering. Poor engineering, not poor devotion. So the point is that we don't have to go towards the adrushta explanation when the drushta explanation is sufficient. So it is not that on this particular point about till now I only talked about the present the past karma, like when to look at the present situation and see, look in an immediate context. I mean to look in a bigger context of past life. But this is a good point to end this session. And tomorrow we'll talk about how to see Krishna in our daily life. When to see Krishna's role, when to see Krishna's hand, and are there times when we should not be seeing Krishna's hand? Now, what does Krishna consciousness actually mean? When Prabhupada said that, oh, that the Rath collapsed because of your poor engineering, not your poor devotion. So was it that the devotees were seeing Krishna's hand and Prabhupada was not seeing Krishna's hand? So Krishna consciousness means to see Krishna everywhere. But does that mean we see Krishna as the cause of everything? Or as the sole cause of everything? Did Krishna cause the earth to collapse? Or did gravity cause the earth to, earth to collapse? And when to look at gravity, when to look at Krishna? So that we will discuss in tomorrow's session. When we will try to see, uh, we look at the further the incident about how when draw, when Sita was abducted and what exactly happened at that time. And we will move forward to discuss how Lord um, dealt with Ravana. But let me sum summarize what we discussed today. So we discussed broadly the topic of um, dealing with adversity. We want to deal with adversity in a way that is constructive. But I discussed three points. First was the concept. Concept is that there are multiple perspectives available. Multiple darshanas are available. The same situation can be seen in different perspectives. And then I explained this elaborately. The second point I discussed was the context. Context means that which is the proper perspective. Prabhupada says intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective. Proper perspective means you could say there is a hierarchy of perspectives. There are some perspectives which are helpful and some which may not only be unhelpful but they can even be harmful at that particular time. So we need to know which perspective to see by. And, and what is the proper perspective? It is the perspective that inspires us to do dharma. And the last part was the contemplation that for us as devotees, the dharma is to basically connect with Krishna. So the buddhi, we don't want just buddhi. We want buddhi to do yoga. So therefore, we focus on, okay, whatever has happened, how can I see, how can I increase my desire to serve Krishna? How can I, see, how can I, we go closer to Krishna in this situation? So you focus on that, then we will be able to see the right perspective. So when Lord Ram, when Kaikai Kai was abducted, Sorry, when Kaikai Kai 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 did something wrong, he saw that my dharma is to take care of my family, to make sure the family is united, and therefore I will not hit back at Kaikai. Kai. And he is focused on, okay, some past karma is happening. And for Kaikai, Kai, the one time event and Lord Ram's soft heartedness, 
his maturity that's what eventually transformed her heart and but with respect to ravan he did it not he had done it once to sita but he had done it to many many women before and he had no intention to change himself but then for that lord ram samay dharma is to protect sita it is protecting sita means that i have to fight with ravan i will do that also so basically if we look at these three things what is the concept that philosophy offers us multiple perspectives and then the context is which is the proper perspective for me in this situation and the contemplation is how can i serve krishna when prabhupad said the best prayer that we can offer to krishna is krishna how can i serve you when we chant hari krishna it is not just a ritual what we are trying to do is we are praying to krishna please give me the vision by which i can serve you by which i can see an opportunity see an opportunity to come closer to you in this particular situation thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments krishna thank you so much prabhu ji this is very wonderful explanation that how we should not blame the karma destiny philosophy but try to see the correct perspective in which the things fall so very very nicely explained uh, i just request devotees to uh, unmute themselves and uh, they can ask the question so kaushik prabhu uh, raised your hand hari krishna prabhu dandavat nams okay you can ask hari krishna prabhu ji uh, thank you so much for the class so okay. yesterday in the temple we were discussing that uh, tomorrow it's going to be your class and uh, when i was talking about this a 14 years old girl she was raising this question to me so i don't know how to answer you will be the right person to answer this question she was asking me like uh, why did lord ram left sita when she was having a baby so when i was uh, i i tried to answer her i was telling that it's it is his dharma as a king that he has to do and she was asking me this question like as a, a husband dharma uh, he is supposed to protect his wife but uh, why did he didn't do that so i don't know how to answer this question so i thought to ask you prabhu ji yes this question will require a whole class but i'll try to answer as briefly as i can <laughs> yes so certainly so rams abandoning sita mm -hmm. i prefer the word abandonment rather than exile because while he sent her to he sent sita away or he abandoned sita it was not exactly exile the way it was for himself when ram went to the forest mm -hmm. it was basically he was in valmiki sita was in valmiki's ashram and valmiki's ashram was more or less near ram's kingdom mm -hmm. so he was indirectly under ram's care and shelter only but let's come to it so the first point is we need to acknowledge that it is unfair hmm? that for a man for a husband to abandon his wife especially when she is faultless and when she is pregnant it is undoubtedly unfair there is no point in trying to defend that say so try to say that it is it is not Okay. Well, then if it is wrong, then why would the Lord do it? Is the Lord wrong in doing it? So that is where, see, when the drushta does not make any sense, we need to move towards the drushta. We need to move towards some bigger explanation, uh, some bigger perspective, or a different perspective. So let's look at it for from various perspectives. You pointed towards one particular perspective, but. what are the various perspectives possible so one is people say that it was his reputation that was important hmm? and as a king he has to have a flawless reputation and if it is shown that he is attached to his wife then people will think that okay the king is attached we all will become attached also but if it had been only reputation hmm? if reputation had been the only consideration then why did he not remarry So why did he not remarry um not only that he kept a golden effigy of sita during her sacrifice during when later he performed sacrifices and many sacrifices require a husband and wife to be together and when the wife is not there 
then he did not uh, see any other wife he got and kept her so it was and kept her uh, effigy so normally in a sacrifice if a person is kept or a person is brought we it's understood that sacrifice is pure the sacrifice uh, so therefore the person who is brought there is also considered pure so it, it was not that the case lord ram didn't believe the accusations that is clear it was not that he thought that oh this person accused me uh, accused my wife me to be attached to my wife the wife is in pure and therefore i will abandon that was not the reason hmm? now then then what is the reason so basically there are two main principles over here the first is when when things don't make from a this life perspective we have to look from a bigger perspective so there is in the ramayana only a story described that there was once a demon who was terrorizing the devtas and when he was terrorizing the devtas the devtas finally called vishnu and vishnu got the better of this demon was about to kill him but that demon ran away and took shelter of bhrugumuni uh, even to bhrugumuni's ashram bhrugumuni was not there so bhrugumuni's wife was there and lord vishnu came over there and told you know he is a terrible demon we need to kill him and there is only a particular time you know that demon had various benedictions that he cannot be he has to be killed in this time duration only so his wife said that no he has come under my shelter i will not let him be harmed so vishnu said no he is a danger to the whole universe he has to be killed right now so when she said no i will not let him be killed so then lord vishnu he decided that he has to kill the demon so in a completely painless way he silenced his wife so basically she said that you will have to go over my dead body only if you want to reach him so lord vishnu what he did was he just in a, without attacking her any weapons but he silenced her he stopped her and she got liberated by by lord vishnu's actions and then lord vishnu freed the world from that particular demon and then bhrugumuni came back and he said you know what have you done vishnu and if you done this to me i curse you and just as i am separated from your wife you will i am separated from my wife you will be separated from your wife so now that curse got enacted over here so lord now the lord does not have to accept any curse but the lord respects the brahmanas and therefore he honored that curse so now we could say that bhrugumuni is why why she done something wrong she was only thinking that okay somebody has come to my shelter i am protecting but the result was wrong it is all unfortunate situation so from the context perspective the previous life incident also does make sense hmm? why exactly would she suddenly she didn't even know this person why she offering him protection and i went risking her life for that purpose and when he told she told is a demon still she didn't interfere we don't know so one of there's a famous fiction writer who says that there is only difference between there is a difference between facts between reality life and fiction the main difference between life and fiction is that fiction has to make sense <laughs> that means life many times does not make sense unfortunately so but basically this was bhrugu's curse it became enacted in this life enacted through the ram sita separation hmm? so that's that is the explanation so it is not that sita was condemned by ram in any way so that is more now another perspective here is the devotional perspective so devotional perspective means what that instead of seeing that ram sent sita away do you consider the whole mood okay let's put one more perspective over here it is the selflessness perspective and I'll, that's literally the devotional perspective i'll explain that see selflessness perspective is what 
right in the beginning of the Ramayana, before the main drama happens, Dashrath and Ram. What happens is, Dashrath sends Ram to exile. Now in today's world, from today's morality, we can consider that why should even Ram accept the exile? Why should Dashrath have to even say, do that? Okay, he may have given a promise to his wife, but his wife is actually abusing such a promise. She is taking the promise and is ripping his family apart. He could have come up with some excuse and not done that. Now when Dashrath sent Ram away, was Dashrath doing an injustice to Ram? Well, yes. Did Dashrath want to do that injustice? No. But based in that, in that cultural context, Dashrath had to honor his word. So that same spirit actually applies to Ram and Sita at the end of the Ramayana. No, it is not that Ram is a victimizer and Sita is a victim. Just as Dashrath is not a victimizer and Ram is not a victim. It is Ram's greatness of character that Dashrath, when Dashrath told him to go away, Ram went away. Or Dashrath needed him to go away, Ram did. Dashrath never told him, but Ram went away. So similarly, Sita is not a victim. If you think of, it is Sita's greatness of character that Sita understood. Although Sita was heartbroken when Lord Ram sent her away. But did she become resentful? No, she did not. And how do we know that she did not? She did not poison her children's minds against Ram. Normally, whenever there is any kind of separation or any kind of bitterness between husband and wife, let's say there is a separation, then often each of the party who has custody, quite often they poison the mind of the child against the other party. So Sita never did that. So it's, it's a different culture. And in that culture, there were certain values. And those values, the, the what are the specific reasoning? Just as, does Dashrath really have to honor that word? That he is given to Sita. Does Ram really have to be concerned about the kingdom? Now, uh, the perception that he is attached. Well, in that particular cultural context, that was important for Ram. And Sita understood it. She accepted it as well. As I said, she was heartbroken, but she accepted it. The principle there is the common value is the value of selflessness. That when some higher cause is there, we may need to give up something which is immediately important for us. So that's what Lord Ram has done over there. So it's not uh, so that's the perspective of selflessness. It's a the whole Ramayana is a mood of sacrifice, mood of putting the right thing to do is often to put a higher cause below some immediate comfort or pleasure. And the last point is the devotional perspective is that. Between Ram and Sita, there is love in separation. That actually in, the, in life, like I said, one of the themes of the Ramayana is to demonstrate how to face adversity. How, to, how Lord Ram faces adversity gracefully. Now there are different kinds of adversities that can come in our life. But say some people whom we love, they hurt us. Some people whom we don't know, they hurt us. There are different ways in which you can be hurt. But probably the most devotionally devastating form of hurt is when God himself seems to hurt us. That generally when we are hurt, we go to God. But when God himself hurts us, where do we go? Like the gopis of Rindavan, they give up everything for Krishna and then Krishna gives them up and goes away. And they have every reason to give up Krishna. And yet they don't. And that makes them glorious. That makes them the greatest of all devotees. Now, of course, Krishna never gives up the gopis. Krishna enters deeper into the heart of the gopis. And Krishna becomes an ever-living presence over there. So similarly, when Lord Ram gives Sita up, there, Sita has every reason to reject Ram. But Sita does not reject Ram. And that is a testament to Sita's supreme devotion. That 
sometimes even when a person is rejected by god they don't reject god that now this is a extreme devotional lesson and only sita can be sita can teach such a lesson nobody else can actually teach such a lesson so that if we look at the ramayan tradition what are the values that have inspired by it is it that a family member small suspicion abandon them that is not the value that has been taken by the tradition the value is that you know just as say ram followed his father that lakshman followed ram this is bharat and ram were fighting not to grab succession but to give the succession to others so the values that have been emphasized in the tradition are the values which we need to, which we need to emphasize sometimes when the lord teaches something the lord and the associates may teach through some extreme examples so the last point i'll conclude now there are often extreme examples in scripture so the purpose so extreme examples means say ajam enchanted one name of narayan and he was saved from all sin or bharat got attached to one deer and because of that whole lifetime of uh, renunciation was undone and he had to take life as an so extreme examples that is not meant to standardize the extreme it is not so it is not that we all think that oh we all just will chant one name of narayan we will all be delivered no parikshit maharaj himself doesn't think like that parikshit maharaj doesn't say okay seven days why should i hear the bhagavatam when the when the poison when the poisonous bird comes that time i'll chant narayan shukde go swami shut up i don't need to hear bhagavatam from you then say that so extreme examples the purpose is not to standardize the extreme it is to emphasize the standard in an ex through an extreme example hmm? through an unforgettable extreme example so the extreme example is not to be replicated so ram's sending sita away is not something that is to be replicated just as there are many things in the ramayana which are not to be replicated just as say sita's going with ram to the forest is something which is to be replicated but ram's going with so lakshman's going with ram is not necessary to be replicated that lakshman had a duty towards urmila and urmila is extraordinary soul because of whom lakshman was able to go but that is not a normal standard for everyone so basically to summarize that at first glance it is undeniably unfair and then why would lord ram do something unfair so at in the immediate context when something seems unfair we look at bigger context so the bigger context are threefold there is a previous life curse which is being enacted over here that the ramayan is demonstrating selflessness and everybody has to do great sacrifice to demonstrate dedication to a higher virtue just as ram did in the relation with dashrath and similarly sita does in the relationship with ram and similarly lastly from a devotional perspective it is that there is the ultimate rejection is rejection by the lord and the greatest devotee will not reject the lord even when the lord seems to have rejected them and the conclusion that these are extreme examples in scripture they are not meant to standardize the extreme it is meant to just teach a standard principle but through a unforgettable example okay any other questions yes mohini mohini thank you prabhu ji thank you so much thank you hari krishna thank you hari krishna prabhu ji thank you so much for the wonderful class prabhu ji in one of the lectures on ramayan i heard that bharat uh dashrath was really upset with bharat and at his on his last breath he told vashishth muni that bharat shouldn't come near him he can't offer his last rites to dashrath so i just want to understand how do you deal with such a situation prabhu ji well this is not said in the valmiki ramayana so i don't think that should be taken very literally because dashrath was definitely upset with kaikai and in fact he told her that you know you have demanded this from me and i am bound to give it to you 
But after this, I reject you as my wife. I want nothing to do with you. But whether his anger extended to that Bharat is open to question because Bharat was not actively involved in the conspiracy and Bharat was away from it at that time. So I would suggest that this is a dramatic retelling which uh, is not in harmony with the uh, original text. And that's why I think it has to be taken with a little bit of suspicion. Mm, uh, not just uh, like a pinch of salt, maybe a bucket load of salt. So now, but the other question is of, uh, is your bigger question is how to deal with such situation is how to deal with the bitterness or what are you trying to ask? Yes, when like when someone close to you, uh, I mean, you're being misunderstood. How do you, you feel very hurt? So how do you deal with that? Well, yes, that's a good question. I think there are what Bharat does is in, Bharat comes back to the kingdom. So his uh, he is considered guilty by association. So he's aghast to hear this. So He's, he's completely shocked. So how does he actually win back the trust hmm, hmm, of the citizens after his, so when falsely accused? So broadly speaking, there is three C's. First is condemnation. He unequivocally condemns Kaikai. Hmm? He doesn't hesitate. He says, you cannot be my mother. The woman whom I know as my mother, whom I worship, could never have done anything like this. You must be the goddess of destruction, Mahakali. Entered into our family to destroy our entire dynasty. He says, you are not my mother. He unambiguous, not just privately, he publicly also distances himself from her. Then he offers clarification. The condemnation of the wrongdoer. Mm, what if, if we are associated with something wrongdoing? Clarification to all the stakeholders, all the people who are hurt over here. The hurt. Uh, so again and again, Bharat has to assure. He has to assure Vashishta Muni. He has to assure Bharatwaj Muni. He has to assure the courtiers that he has no desire for the kingdom. And we can say words are cheap. Anybody can say anything. But then the last part is correction. So Bharat goes to the forest and he takes all the representatives or the representatives of the various branches of the citizens uh, with him to add weight to his appeal as well as to demonstrate the earnestness of his request. So when Lord Ram refuses to come back, and he begs and he has made a plan B. He doesn't come back and say, okay, Ram refused, what can I do? I'll be the king. He has already thought of and taken up as a plan B with him. That he has Ram's padukas. And he uses those padukas and places them on the throne. And he sits below the throne. So the, the position in the court reveals the disposition in his heart. So basically, when as appropriate, we do these three, three things. Correction of, so of the wrong, condemnation of the wrongdoer, clarification of the, with all the concerned people, the stakeholders. And we do our part to correct the wrong. Then the false accusation that will gradually be dissipated. Some people may still hold on to that belief, but most reasonable people will be ready to listen to reason. Okay. Any last question? Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Uh, Prabhuji, just one uh, uh, clarification on the previous answer on uh, Ram, uh, Lord Ram abandoning Mother Sita. So this uh, particular curse, uh, which is from the past life, uh, can we not consider that uh, as the first time when Mother Sita was taken away? That at that point of time the curse came into effect. Like, how do we know this is the after effect of that curse, or if the previous one was the uh, from the curse? Well, there is there is no 
the description that Rugumuni was reunited with his wife, as far as I have seen. So maybe he was in a future life or maybe in a, another kalpa. But the point is that Rugumuni got angry, even if the Lord revived him. Once the curse is, uh, there are different uh, renditions of the story, in different places. But even if he is revived, the point is that Rugumuni was upset and he cursed. And that curse led, led to separation. So when he cursed, he thought that his wife has been, is dead. So therefore, he, he cursed that this will be a permanent separation. It's not a temporary separation. So when the abduction was there, it was a permanent separation. So that's how that is generally associated with that. Now, yes, it could be associated with this also. But uh, I don't think that's the... That the that, that's one of the Ghana Karmanogati we say that which past action which will, will lead to which present action that is difficult to understand. But in general, when the separation is much more painful, it's a cloud of uh, suspicion, it's much more long lasting, that's, that's a far more severe curse which leads to that. Hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you, Pro. And there's one more question which uh, some devotees has uh, requested to uh, to be asked. Uh, we have often seen this in the English literature uh, that you know they put uh, now when it comes to uh, Sanskrit and the pronunciation, uh, there's a lot of emphasis put in the names. Of the Lord that we are chanting, but then in English, like Arjun becomes Arjuna, Ramayana becomes Ramayana, so that A is put at the end. Uh, so this is the question: is like, why do we do that, and does it bring down the effect in any way uh, when we are trying to address the Lord or any particular personality? Well, good question. I'd say two different things. From a, I'll talk about it from a devotional perspective as well as from a historical perspective. Uh, now, uh, from the gramma strictly grammatical perspective, there might be one particular pronunciation. Mm -hmm. But uh, grammar is not necessarily the supreme truth. From a grammatical, from a devotional perspective, there are well-known words that... Murkho Vadati. Uh, om, like we say, Om Vaishnave Namaha. So it's not Om Krishnave Namaha. It's Om Krishnaya Namaha. Hmm? So there is a verse in the Purana which says that Murkho Dhiro Vadati Krishnaya Murkho Vadati Krishnave Krishnaye Ubhayosu Samam Punyam Bhavagrahi Janardana. So, from a devotional perspective, the Lord sees the bhav, the emotion. And that's important to understand. Don't get caught in technicalities. Now, from a historical perspective, there is always this debate. When we study language study, those who study language is called linguists. Linguistic study or linguists. So, is their job prescriptive? Or is their job descriptive? That means, is their job to describe this is how the word is used. This is how the word is pronounced. This is how the language is used. Or is it described? This is how people use it. Well, there is always a tension between both of them. Now, we could say our grammar rules. We have, some of us study Brandon Martin or some other grammar book. They say, you know, this, this is the way this grammar returns. They don't end, end a sentence. Don't use a split infinitive. Or don't end, end a sentence with two or something like that. So many times those rules are violated in actual usage. And sometimes what is considered wrong by grammar today will become so widespread that it will be accepted by grammar tomorrow. Hmm? So, okay, Vishnaya, Vishnaya and Vishnaya. So not Krishnaya, Krishna. Thank you for that reference. Mm -hmm. So there is a, in the comment the verse also is mentioned 
So those of you want, they can look at it. But if you consider languages that are too prescriptive, too much, basically they become extinct. Because if the language as the rules become very different from the way common people speak, basically common people sp stop speaking that language. Now that is what happened to late Latin, for example. Latin was such a influential language. At one time, it was considered a sacred language in which many of the great wisdom of the past was given, in the, especially in Europe. Now, if it is, if a language becomes too descriptive, there's a problem that it just becomes disconnected from the way people speak. Sorry, it becomes too, if it's too prescriptive. Now, if it is too descriptive, then it becomes chaos. That, okay, these people use this word this way, these people use this word that way, these people use that word that way, and that's all. Then nobody understands what is what is being spoken. If any word can mean anything, depending on how, who uses it, then the, the language will become chaotic. So English is itself a good example of a language that has survived and thrived for many hundreds of years. And it survived because it has had this balance between prescriptive and descriptive. So it has been quite open to taking in words from different languages. Like in English, it's a difference of tomatoes and tomatoes, uh, potatoes and potatoes, whatever. That is a minor pronunciation differences. There's British English, there's American English, there's an Australian English, there's Indian English. There's some variants, but it's English. So. Sanskrit is now thankfully becoming, there's a reawakening in Sanskrit. So Sanskrit never became extinct. Uh, Sanskrit was still always spoken and venerated and respected, but Sanskrit was not any way widely used. But now, thanks to the revival and the rejuvenation of Indian spirituality, Sanskrit is becoming more and more an object of interest and study, and even to some extent, conversation for people. So we, especially in the medieval times, 12th, 13th, and 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, what happened is Sanskrit became very ornate, very complicated rules of grammar, very complicated compositions, uh, word formations, and all that. And because of that, Sanskrit became more and more distanced. Sanskrit was always the language of the wise people, of the Brahmanas. But Sanskrit became further and further away from the common masses. And that's why we see that even the Bhakti tradition, most of its most significant literature are, most of its most wide, widely read literature, not necessarily significant. The Valmiki Ramayana is the most significant, I mean, that, it's the original Ramayana. But the Ramcharismana, the Kamba Ramayana, the others have been retold and cherished much more. So we don't want Sanskrit to go towards the direction of Latin, where we become so prescriptive that it becomes extinct. So yes, I think that this kind of variation between, the, uh, between Ramayana and Ramayana, or Arjuna and Arjuna, if we make too much of an issue of it, we are going so much in the direction of prescriptive that we will end up endangering the, or at least substantially limiting the rise in the spread of Sanskrit. And we may, in the name of protecting the language, we may end up reduce it to just an extinct language, a dead language that was spoken in the past, like has happened to late. Okay. So thank you very much. We'll continue tomorrow and we'll discuss about how to see Krishna and Krishna, that Buddhi Yoga, what does it mean and how to apply it in our lives. We'll discuss in tomorrow's session. Shri Ramachandra Bhagwan Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, Thai Gaur Primanandi. Hari Hari Bol. Hari Bol, thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Thank you. Uh, we Happy like, to be here, sir. Yeah, we'd like to thank Prabhuji by loudly chanting three times. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. 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 Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Is Grace Chaitanya 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 Chait
Thank you, dear devotees. Jai Shila Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.